Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, Victory in the West system. Uh, have, I think, the rest of it all in there. I think there's only two other games in it. It's something of a precursor, I understand, to the Variable Combat system, which I picked up, I guess, the only game of that as well, Salerno. Um, I want to give that a, a shot and compare that at some point as well. My intention right now is to play through all three of the SPI games that were printed under this that I'm aware of. And uh, I made the decision to start with Operation Grenade uh, for a number of reasons. One, I've played it before. I've played it in Sicily before. I haven't played Patton's Third Army. Uh, and uh, Sicily is a little bit more complicated. And I'm missing a bunch of pieces, I think, from Sicily. Not positive. <laughs> I may have bought another copy of it, so I may not actually be able to do Sicily. We'll see. I've played it since I lost a, a lot of pieces, which is kind of a weird thing to do. In this particular game, I'm missing one piece, which I've got here. That's a, I know what that is. It's one of these artillery pieces. Um, well, I'm missing one that I know of. It's possible I'm missing some uh, Volkstrom. It's possible I'm missing some reinforcements, which I should be able to duplicate. And it's also possible I'm missing some of the strength counters. And the reason is this is a game that I have had. Sicily's a special case, basically it got moldy um, and the cat played with it. But in this case, it's a game that I had very early on. Um, one of my earlier subscription games from uh, s &T, and yeah, and I only subscribed while it was in the SPI period, so you can tell. I wasn't in all that long, just a couple of years. But uh, uh, it's been through a lot of moves, a lot of places I've played. It's not one I've played a whole hell of a lot. I mean, it got its maybe four to six plays or whatever in my life but uh you know it's world war ii it's kind of operational what am i going to say it's not necessarily the kind of thing that's really up my alley so let's take a look at the map which is rather garish for a simmons in design a lot of space taken up over here by the charts and tables and that's definitely useful in terms of like if you're playing it opposed, you got all the things facing you that you need. I'm going to have to move around a bit to see them. Um, but if, you know, given that the map itself is so small, using the extra space for that, that's one of the nice things that SPI tended to do when they had the room to do so. I, I guess really the only thing that juts out at me is these red hexagons which you know uh, are entrenchments and fortified positions it reminds me a little of kaiser's battle also from the same era and i think the decision of oh look we have full color um i think it kind of affected simonson's eye towards what uh, towards beauty Although there's still a great deal of functionality present here. And in fact, it uses the color very well for functionality. It's just those things are kind of ugly. So sort of the, this game came at a point where um, it sort of was the culmination of the, what seemed like the standard of what uh, your operational World War II type fighting was going to be like. Uh, eh. There's some things missing. Uh, I don't think there's like an exploit phase, for example, in this. But that probably doesn't apply as much in the West. Um, but uh, in terms of combine, uh, in terms of the type of combat chart it uses, taking terrain as uh, locations, you kind of see this now in the OCS series, right? Uh, the different terrains uh, give you different locations in the ratio chart. Um, the combat gives you the option to retreat or take losses in some cases. Uh, concepts like combined arms, artillery fire, uh, air power, um, 
certain positional advantages, etc. Giving you column shifts instead of just adding their strength or uh, something along that lines. Now, there certainly have been uh, divergences from this kind of design, but this seems like sort of very close to the straightforward design for the period, with one major twist to the core system, which is the concept that you don't know how strong your troops are. Uh, when forces first go into combat, you're going to be pulling one of these chits and you'll be using it to determine what the strength of the unit is. And that sticks with it for the rest of the game. And uh, I think there have been other games with hidden combat strength in them uh, that went before this. But this has this whole big mechanism to surround it. And in addition to that, it has... Uh, uh, you can't examine the opponent's forces, so it's harder to play the odds game, you know, the way that you can in the Avalon Hell games and some of the SPI games of the same era. All right, I guess let's dig in. I'm going to hit the uh, standard rules for the system here and cons and concern myself with those, and I'll go to the exclusive rules uh, when we start the actual Operation Grenade, just so that... <laughs> I can do each of the games with their specifics. Now, their specifics are actually fairly complicated. You know, the standard rules for this are what? Eight pages, including charts and tables, and sort of this introductory section. So I call it six pages of real rules. Whereas this is a few pages of additional Chrome. Um, and there's a fair amount of chromey type stuff in here. Uh, when we get to those column shifts and everything, they have a chromey feel. Okay, let's take a look at what we have. First, uh, the actual combat counters. So they have their designations. Designation is actually going to be important in this. There's unit cohesion uh, type capabilities in the fighting size, of course. Nice thing here is the setup hexes. Uh, I find that a useful... Um, device even though the setup's all here as well because it allows me to stack the units and sort them so that i can more easily find them and place them on the board um, it doesn't take up a lot of space on the counter but it does take some and i'm noticing uh, maybe why some people didn't like them originally as my eyes get older i'm having trouble reading these things i'm also was having trouble distinguishing between the german and uh, uh u.s units but now that they're on the board they look fine it was over here on the brown surface i just could not distinguish them very well okay um <laughs> what else do we have so we have basically three numbers to your normal uh regimental size unit i guess uh, the first is the combat class. A sounds good. It's not. Uh, I, I'm sorry. A is good. Uh, <laughs> wrong there. A is um, the largest of the units. C is the smallest of the units that are going to use the uh, chits for their combat values. The morale rating, this is... This is where things go perhaps in the reverse of what I expect. I would expect a 1 to be the best morale for whatever reason. I'm just used to that in most games. Actually, it's the reverse. The 3 is the best morale. So you, you will get the best combat chits um, drawn when you draw the 3. Now, the combat class and uh, morale rating, they don't really, like, the combat class doesn't really determine the size in terms of stacking or anything like that. It's just a modifier to the morale rating. And what you're going to read these things as is you pull one for a particular morale rating and you look at the combat class and then it gives you a strength point value for it. So those actually work pretty simply. And on the back side it's their damage side. And that's these. Um, you also, of course, have the unit designation type. And we'll get that has an effect in play, certainly, in this. Um, in terms of determining both mobility and capabilities in combat. So, for example, artillery have some special capabilities. Armor has some special movement capabilities. Uh, okay, the base sequence apply. Um, the allies go first here, and both sides determine their supply status, and they'll be marking units without a supply or isolated markers 
depending on what their supply status is. Supply is going to be traced. Uh, I think it's five hexes. I'd have, I, I'll catch it as we go. Um, but it's going to be traced from a hex to the road. And you don't have to pay movement points or anything. Once you get to a road, then you trace from the road off your side of the map. Whichever the friendly sides of the map are considered to be for the scenario. If you can do all that, you are in supply. If you can't do that, but you can trace to a road, you're out of supply. If you can't trace to a, a road at all, you're considered isolated. And that can only really happen if, uh, if you're surrounded by zones of control, basically. Okay, then we go to the movement phase. Now, it's split into a tactical and a strategic movement segment. They're not really differentiated. Uh, tactical movement allows you to move into range uh, within three hectares. It allows you to move within three hexes of enemy units. The strategic movement is if you're not going to move within that range. And basically the only effect of that is you're going to be using the special movement rate for the roads. Now we have a terrain effects chart. <clears throat> the problem with this is, of course, you're kind of facing each other. You know, uh, the U.S. is going to be on that is moving their units from that side of the board. So there's kind of a desire to be set up this way, but the charts are set up in a different way, but whatever. So we can take a quick look at this. So we have a differentiation between mechanized and non-mechanized movement costs. And you'll see some things like swamps and, well, um, and rivers are prohibited to the mechanized units. But uh, strategic road movement gives you a reduced rate of movement compared to what you can uh, what you can move, use the roads for if you're moving tactically. Tactically, they still reduce your movement to clear, essentially. Well, mechs don't like uh, regular clear terrain. Okay. Then you have a combat phase. The... Uh, Phasing player gets to attack adjacent units, and this is largely a, if you're adjacent to an enemy unit, you have to attack it. All your units that are, all your hexes that are adjacent, actually, because there's some weirdness in the combat due to stacking, uh, must attack all adjacent units, that kind of stuff, I believe is there. And then we just swap. You can see the, there's no exploitation phase, n nothing like that going on, which feels a little strange uh, for a game with uh, uh, of this era on World War II, to tell you the truth. It actually feels a little old compar in that sense compared to, you know, things like Panzerkrieg that have it. Um, okay, do, 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 do. there's no overruns. You can't enter an enemy hex. When you enter an enemy zone of control, you must stop. You can't move from enemy zone to enemy zone. Um, a non-mechanized unit can always move at least one hex, even if it doesn't have enough movement points, as long as it's not entering prohibited terrain. Okay. Mechanized units are tanks, mechanized infantry, self-propelled artillery, and reconnaissance units. Basically things with the little tank oval on them, right? Uh, the differentiation between tactical and strategic is just the uh, whether or not you get to use the road movement, and I believe it's within three hexes. Um, you can move through your own units. Zones of control, surrounding hexes, but not all units have a zone of control. Uh, <laughs> Uh, cadre, we haven't explained cadre. On the back of these units with a letter classification, they have a cadre unit, which is basically just a small, beaten up unit. Now in Sicily, I believe you can build your units back up, but this one, the campaign isn't, or, or the scenario isn't long enough for you to get replacement points. Um, Okay, so those some of the units do not uh, exert a zone of control into the adjacent hexes, but otherwise they exert it everywhere. And there's an exception. We'll see what that is. I 
I think it has to do with uh, entrenchments, but there there are some for the scenario as well that have to do with the rivers. Um, okay. And there's a rule here, no terrain ever affects zone of control. That's bullshit. Uh, okay, you have to stop when you're in a true zone of control. You can leave uh, a zone of control. You don't have to worry about being adjacent to units that don't have a zone of control. They're all or nothing, uh, whether or not they're there. There's no sort of partial zones or anything like that. Um, you can't trace supply through zones of control in general, unless there's a friendly unit in that hex. All right, stacking's a little wacky in this game. Uh, you're allowed to stack three units, any size. <laughs> However, no more than one regiment or brigade sized unit can attack from or be attacked in any single hex during a combat phase. Um, however, artillery brigades are allowed to provide support from the same hex in greater numbers. All battalion-sized units in a hex, and I think that includes cadres. I think they lose some size. Yeah, they become cadre. Uh, uh, must be involved in combat. So this is one of the weird things, is when you get into combat, you're going to be in situations where uh, you might have a stack of like three big units. That's not the case. But the U.S., they have tons of units um, in this scenario. But uh, the U.S. basically has some stacks of three big units in a row. And only one would be able to actually fight coming out of that hex and also defending in that hex. Uh, limited intelligence, I've already kind of gone through that. That's combined combination of these chip markers. Now, once a chip marker is assigned to a unit, it's pretty much gone. If somehow I've lost chip, uh, the strength chips, uh, I may have to recycle them, but I don't think that that's going to be an issue. I don't think I've lost many counters, but obviously I've lost at least one, so... Um, I already talked about how they work. Uh, if a unit doesn't have to fight, it doesn't have a strength chip uh, drawn. So you don't draw that until actually the moment the combat is going to be resolved. You also can't go pawing through the other person's stacks and figure out what they have. Some units do not have uh, strength chips. <coughs> combat itself is uh, somewhat complicated. At heart, it's an odds-based system. You total up the combat strength of the units that are attacking and the units that are defending and come up with a base um, uh, strength point value. Uh, every non-phasing unit adjacent to a phasing unit must be attacked by some phasing unit during the combat phase unless there's some restriction. Uh, all the phasing units ending their movement adjacent to an enemy must attack some unit during the ensuing combat phase. However, if you're in a town or, an or if you're a German unit in an entrenchment hex, and I believe that also affects these uh, improved positions in this scenario. The entrenchments actually have uh, the barbicons around them or whatever. Um, you have the option not to attack, if you wish. Okay. Um, there are no modifications to a combat strength due to terrain. The terrain effects are baked into the combat chart. We already talked about that. It depends on which, for the most part, it depends on which... Uh, level you're on. Now there's some exceptions to that. Uh, if you're attacked entirely across rivers, your combat strength is doubled. If you're in an entrenchment hex, your combat strength is doubled. If both apply, your combat strength is tripled. Okay, if you have another unit occupying a hilltop hex within two of a unit that's defending in the combat, you get the Hilltop Combat Bonus. Uh, that is a one-column shift in your favor, and both sides can get this so it can cancel out. Basically, you have an observation of what's going on in the battlefield well enough that you can coordinate things better, I guess. <laughs> Might also be some indirect fire. Divisional Integrity. 
Okay. At the moment of an attack, if the phasing player has all regiments of a particular division... Okay, so this is an issue, and this is where they, these things come into play. So we've got the 30-19, 30-19, 30-19 division. We have three different regiments of that same division. They all have to be adjacent to the same enemy, not necessarily attack them. And then the attacker gets a one-column shift in his favor. And you can take this for up to two divisions. Now, for the non-phasing player, all you need is a single regiment adjacent to uh, the unit being attacked. A single regiment of the same division, and you get the divisional integrity, one column shift in your favor. I think the defender can only get one. Yeah, and the attacker can only get a maximum of two. The defender only getting one is just, you know, a matter of logic applied to the rules, but it, it is clarified here. Uh, there are some exceptions. The Germans have some two, two regiment uh, divisions which can get it on attack. Okay, also there's combined arms. Okay, the attacker has to have both a tank and a non-tank unit in order to get combined arms. Some combat units have their combat class identification, which I believe is the letter. Yeah, parenthesized. I don't know if we have any examples in this game. I honestly don't know if this applies in this, in this particular scenario. Um, I didn't see any. So anyway, oh, maybe, uh, yeah, there's one. There's one there. So those come with baked in combined arms bonus. And if they attack an enemy, they get a column shift. Or if you attack with a tank and a non-tank unit. Um, this, you get it, uh, you get one shift for each attacking stack that meets the requirements. And I think you're probably only allowed two of these. But I don't see that. So you may be allowed multiple. Um, if a stack of defending units, though, has at least one tank and one, uh, one non-tank, or an anti-tank unit, which I'm not sure that there are any in this scenario, uh, the attacking player can't get any of combined arms bonuses at all. I don't think there's a limit to how many you can get here. Um, and these constitute, again, column shifts, which essentially are like terrain reductions or something. Okay. Um, artillery. Artillery can be used two ways in combat. If they're adjacent to the enemy, then they just use their combat strength to defend themselves or to attack. However, if they're not adjacent to enemy units, um, and they're within three hexes of an enemy or friendly unit defending in combat, you can get a support bonus. Each support bonus is a one column shift in your favor on the CRT. Uh, the artillery has to be part of the same core though. And again, this works with the designation value. Uh, and we gotta be careful to make sure we have, we keep some kind of integrity on the board, and they, they, they're hard to read, um, of at least one of the friendly attacking or defending units, uh, you're allowed, okay, whenever an artillery unit provides a support bonus, it's unable to provide another one for the rest of that particular combat phase, and you can flip it over to indicate that, uh, and I believe you're allowed two per side on this. Uh, no, sorry. The attacker's allowed two column shifts. The defender's only allowed one from that. Uh, it's possible that an artillery could end up being advanced or retreated so that it's now adjacent to a unit. It still gets to fire um, during combat as a support unit. Ah, you can't fall off the ends of the chart. <laughs> You will roll 
call at the end that you're on. Okay. So, um, some concepts here. As long as your strength marker has a strength of three or more, the backside will have a strength on it and you reduce to that backside. But if you have a unit like this that you can see has strengths one, the backside has strength zero. That's not an actual step. Um, so if you flip over and determine and discover, and this happens with strength two or less on those chits, if you flip over and discover you have a zero there, uh, the chits removed from play, and you no longer, and that unit becomes a cadre immediately after it takes its damage. Okay. Uh, okay. So the combat results on the table are represented with a letter, who they affect, attacker, defender, a number, which is the number of hexes you must retreat unless you choose to take more losses, and potentially a parenthesized number, which is the number of steps of damage you must take. Now you can exchange retreat results for additional steps of damage. Um, Let's see about the bold ones though. Ba 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 ba. I don't see the bolds. Okay. If the owning player has to take step losses from his own attack. He must first take these losses from tank units that participated in the attack. If the attacking player has no tank units, he doesn't uh, have any further restrictions. I'm looking for what the effect of the bold is. It probably is spelled out here, and I will find it more easily. A result that's bold indicates a breakthrough. Okay, yeah. Um, that's going to create a greater capacity to push through the enemy forces, and we'll see that in a moment. Okay. Um, so if you have a, a retreat result, and you choose not to take step losses to reduce the retreat to zero, uh, you must retreat the number of hexes indicated, and uh, you go back that many hexes, uh, maximum possible distance to a non-enemy controlled hex. Uh, these are priorities, though. And you may retreat through enemy zone of control, but each enemy zone of control you go through, you lose another step uh, from one unit in the retreating stack. You may retreat in violation of stacking limitations as long as you correct it by the end of your next movement phase. However, uh, if you end up retreating into an ongoing battle, you may not add your strength to that battle in any sense and you will suffer the adverse results. Uh, no, you're actually eliminated if there are any adverse results. Okay. When you retreat, you create a path of retreat, and victorious units which participated in the combat are allowed to advance along that path of retreat. In general, they have to follow it. Advances after combat are performed as following. Each unit moves individually. The first hex must be the hex that was retreated from. All units, except for tank or mechanized infantry, may only advance along the path of retreat. Tank or mechanized infantry can advance the same number of hexes they would be able to, uh, the number that the d retreater gave up, um, but they're allowed to leave the path of retreat and you have to stop your advance after entering an enemy zone of control. You can't advance through an enemy unit, obviously. Mechanized infantry and tank units may never advance or retreat across river unless those are traversed by a road. Uh, okay, the bold face are breakthroughs. The attacker determines the path of retreat in that case, not the, not the defender. Uh, 
and breakthrough is only advantage to the attacker. All units retreating to the combat lose their zone of control for the duration of the current combat phase, which means that you can advance through them. The defending player can't take step losses in lieu of retreating unless he's completely surrounded and has no option. And the attacking player can advance all his units in extra hacks. Uh, for the non-tank, non-mechanized infantry, that means they can take that extra hex to diverge from the path of retreat. Cadres. Cadres are just a step. They don't have a zone of control. Uh, they're considered battalion size. Supply. I've already kind of talked about supply. I haven't talked about the effects of being out of supply. Remember, you have to trace back to a road. I didn't tell you the number of hexes. I wasn't sure about that. Six hexes, not five. Sorry. Um, okay. If you're out of supply, boop, 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 what happens? If you're attacking, your combat strength is halved. It doesn't affect defense for this. If you're tank, mechanized infantry, or reconnaissance, your movement allowance is halved. Otherwise, they stay the same. If you're isolated, remember that's when you can't trace to a road at all. If you're attacking, your combat strength is one. If you're defending, your combat strength is halved on a per in unit basis rounded down. I think there's something that uh, states that nothing goes below one, though. If units are tank, mechanized infantry, or reconnaissance, their movement allowance is three movement points. If they're not, their movement allowance is half. Now remember, the cost for mech units is higher to move into most things. So that, that's a really severe thing. Uh, games, the units that enter the map as reinforcements are automatically in supply for the first two turns they enter the map. If they're on a friendly map edge hex or a hex adjacent to a friendly map edge, they're automatically in supply. And all German units in entrenchments are in supply. And I believe that also applies to these things. So there's a lot of supply there. Um, okay. Entrenchments themselves. Uh, there's no movement point cost to enter them. German units defending in an entrenchment have their combat strength doubled, tripled if it's across a river. Allied units participating in an attack against German units in an entrenchment cannot get combined arms. That's going to be hard to remember. German units occupying entrenchment hexes do not have to attack. Air power. Each player is going to have scenario designated number of air points each turn that count as ground support. Um, they count as column shifts to the right at, uh, on the CRT, and you can use them on attack or defense. Each side can use one air point in any given combat. Reinforcements, nothing too exciting here. If your reinforcement hex is blocked, you can go three hexes away from it, and you can actually, you can always enter the board. Um, there may be more restrictions. That's it. It's a fairly simple game. I don't want to go into the specific rules for grenade uh, tonight. Yeah, I'll go into that on the next video. <laughs> But I just want to give you an idea of this. In terms of my own uh, playing of this, you know, um, I wasn't too thrilled with this one. I really liked Sicily, and that's why I'm very sad that I think I don't have a complete copy of it. I wanted to give Patton's Army a try, but I suspect it'll probably feel kind of like this. Uh, these are all about the period, you know, when the Allies are advancing in the West. So the rules are actually kind of configured specifically for that. And I think that's why you don't have the exploitation phases, etc. Is it was just viewed as that doesn't really, it, it does sort of apply, but it's not as vital as it is on the East Front. So let's simplify the game with that, throw the breakthrough rules in. Uh, to handle some of that and not force you to keep reserves and all kind of complex stuff like that. Um, so, you know, it's a particular view from a particular time and we'll see see how, how it feels today. <laughs> I'm just 
kind of psyched after Frederick, you know, I had more fun with that than I think I ever have. Maybe I'll have more fun with this.